The following episode of the Comics and Crypto podcast is for informational purposes only, and anything expressed by the hosts or their guests is solely their opinion. This podcast does not constitute financial advice, and anyone wishing to invest should seek their own independent financial or professional help. Have fun and enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Sean O'Hare, and I know comics. Hi, I'm Spencer Vogel, and I know crypto. Hi, I'm Kevin Lee Loader, and I don't know sh. This is the Comics and Crypto Podcast. Comics and Crypto, Crypto and Comics, Collectors World in a Digital Age. Comics and Crypto, Crypto and Comics is where the next billionaires will be rich. Comics and Crypto. Today we have the pleasure of interviewing a pioneer in the toy and collectible space. His company, Jazzwares, is the fourth largest toy company in the world, and he's partnered with some of the biggest brands, including Fortnite, Squishmallows, and Pokemon. Please welcome Jeremy Padower. Jeremy, hey! Yo, I'm here. I can't believe <laughs> What's it. What's up? Man, it's so good to have you on the podcast. I've been so excited for this since, really, since we got introduced to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we've, we've chatted quite a bit on Twitter, and it's been, wow, yeah, it's been quite a year. No, you guys, I'm, I'm so proud to be on the podcast with you. Uh, you guys do a great job, and you know, beyond that, you're, you're just uh, really good folks. And uh, it's my honor to be here today. I mean, so much. Thanks for saying that. Yeah, thanks. Absolutely. So maybe we could just start from the beginning. And let's just talk about your collecting career. What was the first thing that you collected? Oh, my gosh. So as a collector, I've, I've been doing this, I feel like since the earliest days of my life. Uh, my brother, my parents were teenagers when they had my brother. And they were in their 30s when they had me. So you can imagine that between those two moments of passion, uh, my brother had a lot of alone time. Um, (laughs) And uh, by the time he was 13, 14 years old, he had spent a lot of time going to flea markets and garage sales. And, you know, for me, I was the great beneficiary of uh, having a big brother that introduced me to coins and uh, memorabilia of all kinds and antiques and and the idea of, you know, him getting a, an allowance and then him peeling off a buck for me or something like that and <laughs> going and buying like a like an Indian head penny at a flea market. Cool. Uh, so age, I was probably three years old and uh, and it was a am- love at first sight, really. That's amazing. And is there anything recently that you've added to your collection that you're excited about? You know, I continue to buy uh what the trainer deck PSA 10 series a and B cards and the trainer decks were interesting because unlike uh, most Pokemon cards that have the blue backs, these had red backs um, and they predated the shipment of the first edition Pokemon cards in 99 into the English market. And they were meant to be played a big time, like played to death. They were meant to be scratched up and banged around because it was to teach kids in the local market how to play. And so they're very rare to find uh, these decks that are sealed. And the sealed decks generally um, are busted open and graded. And that's the only way you can put together decks uh, that are that are full PSA 10. And I right now I have uh, two of the three PSA 10 trainer deck Bs. I think there's uh, 13 or 14 cards or something like that, but I have two of two of the three perfect PSA 10 decks. And then I have the highest graded A deck as well, but no one, I think in the history of humankind has ever put together a PSA 10 A deck. Wow. So I think I'm two cards wow. short on the A deck to get to a 10s. I have nines in those, but yeah, man, I'm still having a lot of fun collecting. And, and it's an interesting time right now too, because there was a moment in time where everything was at its peak. And right now, you know, I would say things are uh, significantly higher than they were pre pandemic, but they're not peak level. So if you're um, good at it, if you spend the time and, and, and the effort to, to get to know the various categories and, and the nooks and crannies, there are deals to be had out there. Yeah. It's incredible. Even up until the past couple of months, we're seeing record sales of a lot of big collectibles in their highest grade. I and mean, we just saw mm-hmm. a $3.6 million action comics one sale yesterday. And then oh, recently, yeah? we'll, we'll dive yeah. into this later, but that 1952 tops Mickey Mantle rookie card, which I'm mm-hmm. excited to talk to you about, but yeah, it's been really, really incredible. Even during the recession or bear market, we're seeing yeah. some big sales. So that the, the 3.6 million action comic, where was that? How was that graded and how did that fit into the universe? 
it's a CGC 6.0 okay. and it was sold on Golden. And okay. the previous sale was 3.1 million or 3.2 million back in January of 2022. And, and that's not the highest graded. The highest grade is a 9.0. Um, a 9.0. That one sold, I think, around around three million a couple of years ago. I mean, and what now that you look back at that, you go, "Wow, that's probably a seven or eight million dollar book." Yeah, and to add to that, which was really exciting, at Miles High Comics, there was a sale that was under the Edgar Church collection, and it was a raw comic, and that comic sold for four point five million dollars, and it's estimated to be a nine point four grade, a nine point four. <laughs> Yeah. Are you serious? I, yeah. Whoa. When did that? I, and that? Oh my God. That, that was that, last year. I mean, there's very few things in life where you can create an arbitrage opportunity like that. <laughs> but you, but you have to have the cash. I mean, you. Yeah. Re, I mean, that's that's a that's not a transaction that you can easily finance. You know, you you can't go to a bank and say, Hey, listen, I've got a great idea. Uh, <laughs> so you've got to lay down some serious cash to put that down. But look, if you know, if you happen to be able to pull, you know, $4 million from the cushions of your couch, um, they probably turn that 4 million into more like 10 at that level, maybe more. I mean, frankly speaking, if it's the highest graded, um, there's such a premium for that, that I think it, I, I honestly believe that people weren't fully recognizing where it could go yet. There had to be a few interim sales for it to really hit the levels that it, that it should hit if it's, at par to other critical collectibles. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I would be so nervous to have that book ungraded and not in a plastic case. <laughs> I, I'm shocked. I'm so shocked. Are they going to keep it ungraded? They're not going to grade it? You know, I'm not sure. That, I, there isn't much details about it because there's a private sale, but I'm shocked that the owner, the original owner, didn't get it graded because they would have got at least probably 2X for that. Yeah, I, you know, there's always something. Who knows? But I mean, I would imagine if there had been something, it would have been vetted and communicated in the auction. Like if the, if the third page was, you know, had some, a little bubble gum stuck to it that, you know, stuck a few pages. I mean, like you would imagine that, like, I don't think they would have sold it without full vetting, uh, full due diligence, but oh yeah anyways, okay. great example of somebody pulling off a, a you know, a caper uh, because they had some cash. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For, for our listeners out there who aren't familiar with your amazing career, can you give us some background on your accomplishments and some of the things you're most proud of? Oh, sure. Thank you. I've had quite a career in the toy business. Um, I've been in toys for a little over 20 years. Um, I'm still in my 40s, so I, I, I had the benefit of starting relatively early. Um, I started at Mattel, uh, where I was in brand management uh, on Masters of the Universe, the relaunch, the 2000X relaunch in, in, in 2000. Hot Wheels, Nickelodeon brands, moved over to Jack Pacific. I was there for 10 years, started as a director there and ended um, as their EVP and chief operating officer of the production group. And uh, we, we focused on brands like WWE and Dragon Ball and Pokemon. And then, we, and then I started, a, I had the opportunity to be involved with startup in the toy industry as a partner. And in the last 10 years, we've gone from uh, being a brand new company to being acquired uh, and now being the fourth largest toy company. And we're in the process right okay. now of our parent company being acquired by Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, so, the, <laughs> the, the, you know, for us, it took a long time to, uh, or it seemed like it took a long time for us to achieve a level of stability. Every year we were introducing something new that would get us to the next year. So it was some sort of cabbage patch item or it was the Girl Scouts activity oven, or it was Teddy Ruxpin, but each one of those things would last just long enough to get us to the next year. And then when Pokemon came in and granted us the global rights to the business just before Pokemon Go, and then invested in us, um, it was uh, a shocking event. I mean, it was uh, seismic. Uh, it was, a, you know, if the Richter scale goes to 10, it was a, it was, at least the 9.4 that we just talked about with that comic book. I mean, to me, it was the biggest uh, career event. Um, and yeah, today we're number four. So behind uh, Lego, Hasbro and Mattel. And we focused on gaming and we have an amazing roster of gaming properties, including Roblox and Fortnite and Pokemon, Halo and some others that we haven't announced yet. But we're also, uh, it, you know, in the, in the fashion business and nurturing and, we're the global, we're the, we're the partner for 
uh, uh, Lucas and Marvel costumes uh, in the U.S. We just took over both of those businesses. Um, just a just quite a quite a situation. What I mean, don't I, you guys do? Jeez. <laughs> uh, we do. You know what? We in order to be a, a healthy company in this space, you've got to be very diversified mm-hmm. because things change. You know, and you always have to be looking for the next big opportunity. So, no, it's a great question. It's if we were Johnson and Johnson or Procter and Gamble, maybe we would have our Lay's potato chips and we'd have 12 versions and that would be enough. But in our world, you have to be all over the old toy retailer. So if it was Toys R Us, you'd need to be in every aisle. Nowadays, it's not. Um, but we're, we're all over the store. One of the properties that you actually didn't mention, I wanted to bring up, uh, yeah. Squishmallows yes, I, is like a, a global phenomena. <laughs> you know, people are obsessed with these things. Um, yeah, my, my ex-girlfriend had like five of them and she's, you know, 25 years old, you know, it's even adults are into these things. It's crazy. So yeah, I, I was curious, how was Jazzwares able to grow such an obsessive fan base around, around Squishmallows? You know, I wish I could say that it's because we're just geniuses and that um, <laughs> and that we're going to do it five more times. But phenomenons are hard to recreate because they're extremely unusual. Um, yeah, I can't believe Squishmallows, the brand that we own and have turned into the largest plush and collectible property uh, that's plush oriented uh, since, you know, since the last big one, which was Ty. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's unreal. Um, we we acquired Kelly Toys in uh, 2019, and Squishmallow was in its Squishmallows was in its second year. Um, we saw a huge promise, a huge opportunity there, and we leaned into it. And I have to say that uh, it is performed about as well as anything that ever has and we're extending it into all categories of licensing now so you know the plushy slippers or the dog beds or whatever it may be but we're also being very careful with it because you know our licensing has been very specific like you know star wars and hello kitty and we we there's others that we're going to be announcing soon but like We've been really, we're not trying to saturate it, even though it's super duper popular because it could Mm -hmm. be around for a long, long time. Yeah, you uh, definitely don't want it to turn into Beanie Babies, that's for sure. (laughs) No, listen, I got to tell you, um, you know, it's interesting. Beanie Babies has a a pretty remarkable business globally still. Um, Yeah, it's just like, you know, once something, you know, at at one point it was an absolute phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And uh, but yet still, it's a very serious business. So um, it's the, the goal is if you have a phenomenon like Hot Wheels was an absolute phenomenon at, at its time. But but mm-hmm. its business is bigger than ever, but it's a stable annualized business. And yeah, there there are other businesses like that. Cabbage Patch Kids is Cabbage Patch Kids is one of our properties. And even though its phenomenon came and 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 arguably, you know, maybe it had another big couple peaks. We still have a, a nice, consistent business 40 years later. So that's really the goal. The goal is to, to keep going. And yeah, no, look, Beanie Babies, uh, you know, it did have an amazing peak, but it, it continues to it continues to drive. Interesting. Did not know that. Yeah. yeah, I had uh, quite a few Beanie Babies growing up. I uh, recently, you know, resurfaced them in my basement and, you know, did some research <laughs> on eBay to see if they were worth anything. But yeah, it d- didn't have anything good in the collection. <laughs> you know, if you go and sort by price, what you'll find is it really comes down to the scarcity of the hang tags. And um, interestingly enough, in a, in a different life, before I did get recruited to Mattel um, and while I was in grad school, I did a JD MBA and finished at Vanderbilt. But while I was there, I was paying for school by developing a series of websites where I faked out Yahoo and named them all with two A's. So I would get listed (laughs) first under every category. And Absolute Beanie Babies was one of my sites. And I was getting, you know, 10,000 people a day through there looking for valuations and stuff like that. So I just I feel like I've been doing this forever because I guess I have at this point. But uh, man. I, I don't feel as old as I look and I don't feel as old as I sound. Uh, but dude, I'm, I might be Yoda here by the end of this podcast. 
<laughs> so we've talked a lot about about uh, physicals, physical collectibles. Yeah. Um, so I was curious: Are you seeing uh, a lot of demand for digital collectibles from your physical collectors at Jazzwares? It's you know, it, it, digital collectibles is the right way to position it because at first it was NFTs, 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 right? And the idea was was really good. It was solid. I mean. Because essentially what was happening is people were releasing programs that one of 10,000 character based or something visually stimulating. And they would say, if you have one of these 10,000 pieces, you are part of this club. And this club has utility, essentially. Welcome to the club. When you, when you, you know, show us your wallet at the door mm -hmm. and you're welcome to enjoy some amazing experiences that otherwise you will never experience. And then on top of those amazing experiences, when we have a metaverse, you're going to be there first. And that's that's a very compelling argument. That's it's interesting. And when you are one of the first, that is an argument that potentially will stick. But when you're the hundredth or when you're the hundred thousandth or you're the millionth club that's going at the same time, it's hard for every club to maintain value or to offer utility that's actually of value. And it's, it's almost like, uh, you know, at one point I had an office that overlooked the Pacific ocean and it was amazing. And the first day I stared out over the ocean, I may have noticed a, a you know, a, a large sea creature and a sailboat. And then by the hundredth day, I, I saw that it was blue. Uh, and then by the millionth day that I was there, I mean, I could have been, you know, at, at Dunder, what is it? Dunder Mifflin? Dunder Mifflin. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like Pennsylvania. <laughs> yes. It's just, so I think that's the, the issue with the digital collectibles is that the barrier of entry is so low. Physical collectibles have always been tied to some fandom um, that exists. And it also requires a company to have... Um, uh, sourcing and manufacturing and retail relationships or distribution of some kind, it, there is an extreme um, opt-out factor amongst people who may, may be interested in participating. You know, even in the world where you can manufacture your own stuff with some sort of digital printer or printer that allows you to, to, to achieve uh, on-demand goods, it still doesn't get you to the mass level and it's still very expensive. So there's still a cost. Um, the concept of, of generating art, 10,000 pieces of art uh, with AI and all of the other things that exist now, um, it's, just, it's just tough. So to the, um, the long answer to your very short question <laughs> is that I personally believe you know, the web one universe where you had um, some of the earliest opportunities to provide utility to, to folks that were on the web. So, you know, the, the Ebays, the, the, some of the search engines like Google, um, when the world burned down, they, there were trillion dollar companies that came from the flames. Web two, you could argue the same thing, what was happening in the app era and the overproliferation, And then from the flames, there are trillion dollar companies that emerge. And you know what will happen with Web3 if you limit it to the idea of collectible NFTs or digital collectibles, I don't know if there'll be trillion dollar companies that emerge from this, but will there be success stories? Sure. It's just that 99.9% .9 of it will burn to the ground and 0.1% will have some viability and then that 0.1% will stratify where, yeah, there will be some that, that survive long-term, probably some of the earlier blue chip ones that you could already identify. So I'm not negative. I think that there is a, I think that there is an opportunity. It's just, it was too easy to enter. It was too easy to rug pull market to people who were under the concept of these glorious ideals like the artists are finally being given their glory. And then you would, you know, five minutes later, you're, you're out half an ETH because, you know, the glory really was a business person in disguise. Yeah. Um, 
And then long term, I think the concept of NFTs will change dramatically to things that have real utility, like music and and tracking of uh, of any intellectual property, really. Mm -hmm. um, so it it will change. I don't necessarily think that digital collectibles are a slam dunk, but I think if you focus on the things that you focus on in physical, like licenses where the intellectual property holder is being very careful about how they establish their, their program, um, some of the early blue chips, and then the idea of NFTs as a track tracking mechanism for consumer products, all of those things will give uh, an opportunity for the flames to evolve a trillion dollar company later on. But uh, in general, uh, digital collectibles have, you know, real potential uh, challenges. And now a word from our sponsor. Looking to buy or sell physical comics? Then check out Elite Comics 11, Instagram's number one community powered comic sales page. Elite Comics 11 is our favorite place to safely buy and sell comics. They are a CGC and CBCS authorized dealer and sell a variety of comics from Silver Age Grails to modern day keys. Inventory is updated daily, and don't forget to check out their incredible almost daily live stream comic sales. The next time you're looking to buy or sell physical comics, make sure you turn to Elite Comics 11. Follow at Elite underscore Comics 11 on Instagram and see what all the buzz is about. Do you think that, uh, I guess, licensed collectibles versus more, I guess, Web3 native collectibles have more longevity or staying power? It, it truly depends on how good the program is. So I'll give you an example of, of what happened with baseball cards. So in 1985, 1986, there was an enormous interest in, in sports cards. It just blew up. Um, and it was interesting because if you looked back a few years, 83, if you look back into the 70s and 60s, you know, some of those vintage cards, very few were kept in, in great condition. They were played with and kept in shoeboxes and wrapped with rubber bands. And But something happened in the mid 80s where, oh, wow, some of this vintage stuff is rare and valuable. And the companies that were manufacturing the cards uh, went hyperbolic, manufacturing um, a lot of mass produced cards under a lot of different set names. And it was before there was grading where you could actually get grades to help stratify the collectible. So it was truly an over indexing of goods. These were licensed goods, but they were handled very, very poorly. And then in the nineties, there was the concept of having chasers in every pack. Well, this pack has, you know, could have some rare cards or autograph series or so no matter how many they produced, there was still a subset of very rare cards and the interest had fallen away, but the program was better. The collecting platform was better. The structure of the collectability itself yeah. was the better. Experience. Yeah. yeah. The experience, the, the unboxing and the surprise, it wasn't just finding Pete Rose in a pack. It was finding Pete Rose's bat. And it was a one of one or Kai Cobb or whatever it may be. And so that took about 20 years, 25 years for people to go, oh my God, between grading, between eBay, where you can see the real time valuation of these things and these hyper, hyper rare items, they had structured a much better system of collectability. In the meantime, the 1980s wax that was worthless because of grading could be stratified and you could have some value at the highest end. So I'm answering your question by giving you a case study. So the case study is in sports cards, there was a period of time where they were worthless um, and they were able to bring it back with a better platform. Um, I personally think that licensed uh, digital collectibles, depending on what's next and how the this metaverse that we're all waiting for with bated breath comes along um with the right collecting platform there's a lot of viability um with the wrong platform there's not uh and in terms of the web3 natives 
Um, like I said, 99.9% because the barriers to entry were so low, um, will never ever come back. They're, yeah. they're trash. Um, and you have a 0.1% that vary from not from being not trash to being really decent. Mm -hmm. And that's just the hard truth of what we're dealing with here. And I wish yeah. that I knew a little less so I could say something <laughs> rosier. <laughs> But I tend to, but, but again, I, I'll say it. I am, I, I am becoming Yoda because I've been on all sides of this thing. I am a lifelong collector. I'm 48, uh, but I've been collecting since I was three. So like I'm a lifelong collector and I stay very current in the stuff that's out there. Um, and I manufacture billions of dollars in products, much of it in the collector space. So I don't know how many people could give you an answer with that much behind it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, yes, the answer is long story, long story short or short, short story long. There will be <laughs> some value in digital collectibles it has to be the right platform. Yeah. And uh, licensed versus generic it still needs to be the right platform. That and that's sense. something that we, we definitely endorse on, on our podcast. We focus on the platforms that sell li digital licensed collectibles. Yes. You know, like, like Wax and Quid, uh, Eternity. big fan of Eternity. Yeah. I have quite a few on there. Mm -hmm. And of course, yep. of course, VV. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. And, and you know, yeah. I will say like, I have not sold any uh, of, so I, I have focused on some of the blue chip programs world of women um you know I, i'm friendly with gary and i and i picked up a v friends nice. um ver, uh, second v friends invisible friends and you Do know you clone? i, I probably i don't know did they just drop those it's a uh, clone x uh it's created by artifact studios which was acquired by nike back uh last november no, you know what i don't I don't, but, but maybe, maybe in a different dimension, I do have a clone, but I don't know. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, I mean, you know, I put a lot of time and effort into VV. Uh, I certainly like the platform that, it, that Eternity put together. Um, I think that Top Shot was interesting and, and, but, but again, what consumers really want more than anything is a path. They want to understand that there is a path. They want to be able to make sense of that path. And you really have to reinforce it over and over and over again for you to achieve long-term value. You know, there's a lot of companies out there that were taken by surprise at how enormous the response was. And, and there's a lot of opportunism that comes from that. Um, I don't know how it all plays out yet. But I, I personally do, you know, VV, like I, like I haven't sold a single digital collectible. I haven't sold one single OMI. And I'm one of the earliest holders of OMI. Um, it would be exciting uh, to see that token tied in very specifically and in a very meaningful way um, long term. Uh, and then for that to find its way into, um, you know, other use and other utility. And, uh, and I've always believed in the leadership there. I've always believed in the leadership at Eternity. Um, so maybe we're going to have some exciting times ahead. I mean, I can tell you this with something like VV, I don't think I've ever been as excited or bullish personally about something. The very beginning and now, I, I still have the same number of OMI. I have not sold a single digital collectible. And I'm, ex I'm, I'm excited to see the future. I, I still think that they have quite a potential ahead of them. I, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the same way. The only reason I ever sell a collectible is to accumulate more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and just seeing the community of people that are so in love. I with love them. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. They're amazing. They're amazing. I, and they're getting excited about collecting physicals now, just as much as mm -hmm. they are collecting digitals on, on VB, which is really exciting for us because we're, we're a podcast that endorses the physical and digital space. So we're, yeah, it's very exciting for us. Oh, I love, I, I love that. And I think your name says it all, you know, uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, like it, it is, um, it's, it's a, a very interesting, like if you can, if Phoebe can hold 
their critical licensing partners and develop a long-term platform. Um, Rome wasn't built in a day. And like I told you, uh, it was 20 something years before the card business really had the renaissance based on a really solid platform that was built. So I'll give you, you know, I know that we're not ready to move on to the Mickey Mantle PSA <laughs> discussion or, or that's, that's uh, next question. discussion, <laughs> but maybe I'll transition myself and to say one thing, <laughs> you know, the 25 year horizon is an interesting one because in 1999, uh, one of the three PSA 10 Mickey Mantle rookies sold for $175,000. And it is 2022. It's 23 years later. And if that card went up on auction today, it's a 30 plus million dollar card. So that's roughly 150 times return. Now, 150 times means for every thousand dollars, you've got $150,000. And for every million dollars, you've got $150 million. I mean, those types of returns are difficult to find ever. Um, they can happen in collectibles under the right circumstances and with the right item and concept. Who will win this race is who has the best platform of collectability. And, and the token component is absolutely critical. I've said it from day one. The token component, you have to not just have a vested interest in the collectible here, but you have to have a vested interest in the entire system of collectability, including the currency. Um, so I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. I really, I really like uh, and love the community. I like the, the leadership there. Man, it would be amazing if, if, uh, if they were the next story like that. This concludes part one of our two-part interview with Jeremy Padower. In the next episode, we will be discussing the record-breaking sale of a $12.6 million sports card, the connection between physical and digital collectibles, the importance of NFT mint numbers, AR technology, and the future of the collectible space.